Well, good afternoon. It is 1230. I'd like to welcome you to this week's uh, Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook uh, brought to you by NDC Extension Agribusiness. Uh, once again, we'll be covering a, a variety of points related to the agricultural markets, uh, especially as impacted by COVID-19. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Parman. Thanks, Dave. All right, so this uh, this segment uh, and this week, I'm going to go ahead and talk about, again, the uh, employment situation, since that's such a critical component and uh, where I see that going here in the future. Um, and uh, as well, I kind of want to talk about housing prices. That's something uh, important that I'll dig into uh, as we move along here. So the first slide I've got is the usual uh, initial jobless claims from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. And I've got last week's number. And again, you see that these numbers are, begin are trending down. There's this continued downward trend of new uh, filers. There's two reasons for that. Number one, businesses, fewer businesses have, uh, are, are laying off employees than, than the initial period when, when COVID hit. And then the second part is a lot of the business uh, have already let them go. And therefore, you know, if anything that's not reopened or whatever, the, the initial claims, as you would expect, would spike early and then and then trend downward. Uh, this is still historically large numbers of people on unemployment, despite the fact that this is the lowest level since this uh, last the, the week ending last week was the lowest since it really peaked up. It would still have been historic by all the metrics that we have since we've measured this for a, a, a new weekly jobless claim. Yes, it's below 2 million, but again, that previous record was about 695,000 or so. So yes, it's trending in the right direction, but this is still a historically high number. Now, weekly continuous jobless claims, okay, so uh, which is shown on my next slide, uh, what it basically has done is flattened. So it, it came down a little bit, but it's flattened out. Um, some folks have went back to work as businesses have reopened. And so while we have, you know, 1.8 million last week uh, and, and, and about 2 million the week before, we can see that as businesses are opening, some folks are finding jobs again. So this weekly continuous claims, these are people who filed more than one week, um, is, is leveling out. It's still extremely high, much higher than uh, the, the uh, financial uh, crisis recession. But it, again, it's stabilized. Moving forward with unemployment, uh, just one last comment on that. Um, what, we're, what the market and what everyone is gonna be watching is how fast this comes down. We know it's high, everyone knows it's high. They're basing decisions on the fact that this is going to improve. Folks expect it to improve as businesses reopen. But what I talked about last week is how many businesses fail to reopen or fail shortly after reopening after a disaster that's gonna be watched. So I'm gonna shift gears now to housing prices a little bit. Okay, so some information came out and according to some indices, May home prices were up 5.4% annualized and up 3.6% in April. So during this whole crisis, <coughs> and when I talk about annualized, what I mean is uh, it, it wasn't 5.4% in a month. It was 5.4% for the month of May as if it had continued from, for 12 months at the rate that it was increasing. But still, these the increases for the the rate of increase for May and April was a little was a little bit high when you think about the fact that not a lot of homes were selling, um, folks were losing their jobs. We have this historically high unemployment, and so part of the reason for that is short supply due to COVID. I mean, folks weren't able to sell homes in person. Uh, they people didn't think it was a good idea maybe to upgrade or sell their house at this time due to all the uncertainty. So there was short supply of homes. And then you had some pent up demand, especially among millennials. That's what they're finding is that millennials who for the last, you know, 10 plus years have been looking at renting for the most part condos and townhomes and living closer to the, the center of cities and, and looking for nightlife and atmosphere and those kind of things they've shifted and started to move out into the suburbs some more and in the, into these single family homes. And so this COVID thing apparently has kickstarted, especially with the low interest rates, them, them moving in that direction. That despite new housing starts, and this goes back to that short supply decreased 30.2% in April, which is a record drop going back to the time this was even 
uh, seen in 1959. Typically, new housing starts are a good macro indicator for how the economy is doing. Where you see a big dip like this, it means we're moving, we would be moving into a massive recession, which has happened. But the other reason for new, it wasn't a market driven a lot in a lot of cases for the new housing starts drop. It was actually because construction companies couldn't operate. They couldn't, they couldn't build homes, even if they wanted to due to the lockdowns. Now, equity is a big thing uh, right now, uh, talking about homes. And it's not going to be like the financial crisis. Uh, the expectations are that homes uh, may, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, be declining in value over the next year. But the equity position in is a lot better than it was back in 2007 and 8. You didn't have these subprime balloon payment borrowing where they were borrowing 100% uh, of the expectation with a ballooning interest rate. That hasn't been happening in these extremely low interest rates that fixed low interest rates means that nobody's gonna have to worry about their house value falling say two or three percent and then and then having to refi refinance uh, with, a, with a much higher interest rate. And so my next slide shows what this new housing start since December 2018 looks like. And if you go back, it's, as, it's not as low as what happened happened before the financial crisis, but it is the biggest single period drop uh, since this has been recorded. I mean, that's over, again, 30%. So my next slide is a map of the US that I took from a, a, a news source, Mortgage Daily. And it just shows, now this is nominal, but the average home gain uh, in, in, in several of the states. And if you look at North Dakota, uh, the average home in North Dakota gained $4,000 in value uh, over the last year. Okay, so that's that's pretty strong. In some of these other states, like New Mexico, gained fifteen thousand dollars, Arizona twenty thousand dollars, Idaho up twenty four thousand dollars on average per home. So, again, the equity position, and to put this into perspective, most people uh, outside of ag, their measure of wealth is in their home and in the stock market, their 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 savings and their investments. So, it's to equate it to farming. All right, it's kind of like farmland value, cropland values and pasture land values. As long as those remain high and folks equity position in them is strong, then their wealth looks good. They look decent on the balance sheets and there's not a whole lot of worry among lenders or, or the borrowers themselves that they're underwater or in serious trouble. Same thing just applies to home values in the stock market to those who are more who, who aren't in ag. Uh, as long as their home value stays strong and the, and the stock market stays you know, relatively, relatively high. Uh, they feel good about it. They, 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 they continue to spend. We're a consumer driven economy and, and that's important. So again, this is a good, a, a good position because they could fall a few percentage points and it's not going to put most people underwater, not even close, not like the financial crisis of uh, 10 years ago. So my next slide just shows these future home values. Um, and I used the Zillow analysis, uh, uh, that's available to anyone online and medium home median home values. And remember the median is a point at which ha exactly half the homes in North Dakota are below this number and exactly half are above. So it's not an average. It's the median uh, is about $237,000 values increased over the last year in North Dakota, almost 2%. And that's where you get that 4,000 bucks on it. Uh, kind of pretty close to average. And they're rating it mostly a buyer's, buyer's market here. Part of that's what's gone on with the en en energy industry and ag's been a little bit depressed being our two biggest in. The forecast for North Dakota is a decline of about 2.2% in the next year. That's a pretty small decrease, uh, all things considered. So um, we, we don't expect home values in the state to really drop. Now for the US, home prices are actually up on average 4.1% in the last 12 months, so up pretty strong. And they rate it mostly a seller's market. And even in North Dakota, you're gonna have pockets that are hot where uh, home prices are increasing. You'll have pockets where they're decreasing due to new school construction, et cetera, et cetera, or maybe in the areas like the gas and oil fields where they decline much more than 2%. But uh, this is again, just an average, which explains everything without explaining anything. And then uh, uh, the prediction for the U.S. over the next 12 months is, uh, is a, sm a small decline of 1.5%, which again is not enough to put most borrowers underwater. By far and away, more people have more equity in their home than 1.5%. Than so my final slide, I just show the median home prices for selected North Dakota cities, uh, with Bismarck being the highest median at 263 
And of the towns that are displayed, Grand Forks being the lowest at 147 and a half thousand. I had Devil's Lake on here, but I had to throw them out because there's a lot of lake homes and cabins that sell for, you know, a lot less than $100,000 dragging that average down uh, dramatically. So I didn't have a lot of faith in that. No, it's basically where it sits now. And again, a slight decline. So moving forward, it doesn't look like uh, real estate values in, in terms of homes and everything else uh, is, is, is going to be a problem. But at the same time, uh, we got to watch the markets and everything else, because again, this is a consumer driven economy the money that's spent, the more beneficial it is to ag, especially livestock sector. And so this is something we're going to continue to watch and things could change pretty dramatically depending on what happens this fall. Do we have a vaccine? Do we have a big spike during cold and flu season? All of that's going to play a, play a role in this, but as it stands right now, we're not in a terrible position or even really a bad position at all as far as values. And then again, we'll continue to watch this unemployment um, situation and, and see exactly how fast we get a rebound out of that. So thank you. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Frayne Olson. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Frayne Olson, I'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, this week, I guess I'd like to kind of continue on the theme of looking forward and, and evaluating what are the core var variables that the marketplace is looking at? Um, what are some of the things happening now that we need to be paying attention to as we move into this kind of critical um, summer season where we tend to see a lot more volatility in prices? Um, so this week, I'd like to focus kind of globally and, and identify a few of the key variables, um, and, and in particular, some, some of the specific countries that I'm watching very closely to try and in, get an indication of possible shifts or changes. So before I do that, on my first slide, I'd like to just kind of quick provide a, an overview of what came out in the WASDE report. WASD stands for the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Um, every month, USDA updates their current position and the forecast uh, moving forward. Um, and, and at this time of the year, we're really looking kind of at two marketing years at the same time. Uh, we're looking at the 2019-20 marketing year, which is old crop, as well as the 2021 marketing year, which is the new crop. Um, so I just highlighted in red is the numbers that came out on the report. If you look at the very top row, uh, highlight uh, the bolded ones in black are the what the trade was expecting. So that was a uh, it, there's a survey done of, of uh, forecasters, private forecasters said on, on average, these forecasts were expecting the number to look like this. And then on the red is what USDA actually provided us uh, yesterday. And as you can see, let's start with to the 2019-20, which is old crop. When we look at the actual numbers, now this would be for ending stocks. So the ending stocks number captures both potential changes in the supply side as well as the demand side. Um, so it's kind of one number and calculates pretty much everything that we're looking at. And, and if you look across there and compare what the trade was expecting versus the number that we actually came out um, from the USDA, very, very similar numbers. Um, there really weren't any ma major surprises within the whole report. There was a few tweaks and changes here along the way that we're kind of paying attention to, but in, in the whole grand scheme of things, relatively minor shifts. So looking at 2019, 2020, again, relatively small changes. Um, on the 2021, I just wanna comment a little bit on the wheat number uh, because that, that will come up later on in our discussion is that uh, the expectation, or at least the, the forecast for the average wheat yield in Kansas actually jumped a little bit from last month, last month's forecast to this month's forecast. That increased the potential for production, which then increased in, 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 without any changes in the usage side, basically increased the ending stocks number a little bit. So that was one of those things that was a little bit of a surprise. We weren't really expecting that, but it, it, it did show up. So again, if you compare the bolded line on the very top versus the bottom line, which is the red one, you see some subtle differences. You also notice that when we look at the range, what's the highest trade estimate versus the lowest trade estimate, it's a much, much wider range for new crop than it is for the old crop. Uh, you know, Again, there's fewer variables that can happen um, in the old crop between now and the end of the marketing year. So summarize, not any real big shifts. Uh, a lot of the numbers that we expected to see are the ones that we did see. 
So on my first slide or the next slide, really focusing on kind of the global situation. I started with probably the simplest global market to follow, which is soybeans. Because on the soybean side, we have you know, a handful of exporters, major exporters, and we have really one dominant importer. Uh, but I, I, to provide some scale and scope, I just wanted to compare, and again, these are all USDA numbers. Uh, the red slash line is the current forecast. So again, this would be the forecast for new crop soybeans. Um, the blue bar is old crop soybeans. So when we compare kind of the old crop numbers to the new crop numbers, um, I also want to provide some kind of historical context to see what has happened over the last several years in both export volumes and import volumes. So again, as a reference point, Brazil is the largest soybean exporter in the, in the world. Um, they surpassed the United States here about five years ago as being the dominant supplier of soybeans. Now again, this is soybean sales globally. Um, U.S. is number two, um, and then Argentina is number three. Now, Argentina produces a lot of soybeans, but most of the exports that Argentina have is for processed product. For They crush it, the, the soybeans into oil and meal before they export the oil and meal products. They don't, not a huge exporter of raw soybeans or of whole soybeans. So when we look at major exporters, again, of whole soybeans, it's really the United States and Brazil. And on the United States, notice the green bar and the blue bar, those were the, the major drop we saw is really because of the, of the trade war between the United States and China. Now, what we are expecting, again, USDA is forecasting, given this phase one agreement, that the re, we'll see a rebound in US export sales, particularly into China because of the agreement. I'm gonna, in a few minutes, make a few more comments about that, but uh, just to show the relative size of the US uh, export market or the amount of beans that we sell versus the Brazilians. On the next slide, we're looking at the usage or the importers. In the global market, who buys soybeans, whole soybeans off the global market? And we have one actually dominant market, which is China. Um, we do have some other markets that are potential uh, uh, uses for both US soybeans as well as Brazilian soybeans, but they are relatively small in comparison. And again, you notice that the green bar, that, that drop that we see is really because of, of the uh, African swine fever and the cutback in the, in the hog herd in China. Uh, the blue bar, again, these USDA numbers, it's a forecast that there's gonna be a rebound, that they'll have some of that under control and the importation of soybeans by China is gonna remain or rebound to, to levels that we've seen in the previously. So the moral of the story on this is if we're going to have and be able to maintain the, uh, a strong export pace for our US soybeans, we really need to have that Chinese market. Um, the European market is, is a relatively stable market as well as Southeast Asia. We have some growth potential in Southeast Asia as well as Mexico. But again, in, in size wise, in relative comparison, they're pretty small. So a couple of comments on and update everybody on what's going on. You know, we do have the phase one agreement. They're pushing forward on, on implementing that. However, given the political tensions that are going on right now between the United States and China, you know, there's some concerns starting to seep into the marketplace. And there's really three issues that politically that we're looking at. One of them is of course, Hong Kong and the change in the, 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 the way that the uh, Chinese government is gonna um, oversee the both economic and political activity within Hong Kong. There's a lot of concern about um, some of the new uh, rules and new new um, requirements that are being put in place. Uh, obviously, there's still some some tension going on with COVID-19, and you know who what country is blaming the other country for the for the creation or the spread of COVID-19. Again, that's that's a political issue, but it is seeping into the marketplace. And the, and the last one that I want to bring up and remind everybody is also the Huawei. Uh, fraud case. So again, the U.S. has requested, uh, and and Canada has it has done this that they would detain the chief financial officer from Huawei, which is the, that very large Chinese uh, technology company. And of course, that is also causing some political strain, not only with with Canada and and in China, but also the U.S. and China, because again, U.S. was one, the one that was was requesting that the. Uh, Canada detain the, the, the CFO. So what I'm, I'm trying to get, get to is that 
we are moving forward on the phase one agreement, but there are these challenges we're facing right now. And again, the market is gonna be very sensitive uh, to their expectations about whether this phase one agreement will be fulfilled or not. Um, there have been some rumors that uh, they may change the time frame, at least for this, this first year of the phase one agreement, they may shift the timeline back just a little bit to, so it doesn't start necessarily on, on, on January 1, when we count, 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 start counting exports, but actually start a little bit later in the season. Again, those are rumors that are flowing right now. I have no confirmation that that's actually happening. Um, I also just on a sidebar, if you look at Southeast Asia, that's a cluster or a group of countries. Um, Southeast Asia is typically defined or clustered as Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. So I kind of listed those on the very bottom. On the next slide, we'll start kicking into uh, corn. And who are the major, what countries are the major corn exporters? Uh, you know, United States historically, and even today is still the largest corn exporter in the world. But you can see um, there's three contenders that are now starting to grow and expand their corn exports and, and are really starting to uh, provide a lot more competition for US corn in the global market. And those three countries are Brazil, Argentina, and Ukraine. And, and when you look at this, the relative size, at least for not only the blue bars, which is, is the old crop, but also now more importantly, the red bars, which is the forecast for new crop, um, those three countries, Brazil, Argentina, and Ukraine, are, are really gaining some ground on the U.S. and the U.S. dominance that, they, that, that, that we had in the, in the global corn market. Um, I do want to comment a little bit about uh, all three of those countries. Brazil, again, we usually think of Brazil as the major soybean export uh, comp competitor. We don't always think about corn. Uh, now, Brazil's corn and the corn expansion has pr primarily been in what they call the safrina crop or the second crop. Uh, Brazil is close enough to the equator that they can do continuous cropping. They'll take the, the soybeans off during their fall or spring, and they'll turn right around and start planting corn back onto the soybean ground. And so this, this safrina crop or the second crop, what they call the winter crop of corn, is really the dominant corn production. And the, the production cycle for Brazilian safrina corn is very similar to that the, to the U.S. one. So they have a very similar planting and harvesting schedule to U.S. corn. So the Brazilian corn right now, there are the core producing regions are experiencing some drier weather. There's some concerns, again, that as the crop is being planted and it becomes... Uh, you know, starts to grow and gets into the vegetative development phase, that these dry conditions, they're gonna be kind of hovering on the edge of, of being too dry and, and, and not having enough rainfall. So there are some concerns starting to enter the marketplace that the Brazilian corn crop may not be as large as we first expected. Now, given the USDA numbers and the current USDA forecast, which is reflected on this graph, um, that is expecting a pretty large corn crop. So if, if there are, if yields aren't nearly as, as good as we expect, if there gets to be some production problems, Brazil may not be as aggressive a seller into the global markets, which then may open up the door for some additional U.S. export sales. Now, the other thing that I'm worried about, and it, it impacts both the, the soybean issue as well as corn for both Brazil and Argentina, is, is their economic strength. Um, again, they had some they had some very economic stress coming into the COVID-19 crisis. Um, Brazil, in particular, has been hitting the news a lot because of their inability to control the spread of the disease and the large death rates they're seeing. And this is really, again, creating quite an economic toll on the country for both Brazil and Argentina. Now, so far, both Brazil and Argentina have been able to meet their export sales commitments. Um, there have been some delays for particular deliveries, but in general, they've been able to keep up. Now, again, will they be able to fill those sales later on? That's something the market's going to watch very closely. Uh, my, my, my final comment, I do want to point out Ukraine. A lot of times you don't think about Ukraine as a major corn competitor for the United States. But as you can see, the last several years, the growth rate in Ukrainian exports have been pretty impressive. And they've now grown to a point where they need, they're a real contender in the global uh, export market for corn. On the next slide, we're looking on the flip side. Okay, what about the importers? Who are the big buyers of corn off the global market? Now, I cheated a little bit. Again, I've got the EU28, which is the European Union. It's all 28 countries. And yes, you know, Britain is trying to exit. And so that these numbers will be adjusted a little bit going backwards. 
Uh, but the European market is a very large market for corn. They import a lot of corn. The European uh, Union has a little bit more difficult time growing corn just because of their climate. Um, and then Southeast Asia, again, the Southeast Asian countries I noted before on the soybean talk are the same ones that we were talking about right now. Um, so again, we have a, 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 process, a pretty diverse field of opportunities to be able to sell U.S. corn into these different markets. Again, as a reminder, I want to kind of remind everybody that Mexico is our, our number one corn buyer. Japan is our number two corn buyer. Um, I guess J Japan has typically been a very stable market for us. They are a very consistent buyer of U.S. corn. If you notice, gr Mexico has had a nice growth rate in the expansion and, and, and increased imports, most of that from the United States. Uh, but again, coming back to the COVID-19 issues, uh, the Mexican economy is also having some, some, some problems. Um, and again, Mexico is also one of those hot spots for, for COVID-19 infections, death rates and, and um, for mortality is, is relatively high. There are some concerns then about potential growth as we move forward, because most of the corn that Mexico imports is the yellow corn that's used for livestock feed. It's the white corn you grown domestically that's used for human consumption for the food products like tortillas. So again, these are some things that I, in the back of my mind, I'm trying to watch very closely is what, how bad is the economic conditions in Mexico and what's the potential rebound in the Mexican economy. So to summarize the corn market, we have a lot of, of potential markets. They tend to be relatively large. Some of them are growing, some of them are, are fairly stable. On the next slide, we're gonna to go to the most complex, which is really the wheat market. Uh, because not only are there a lot of countries that export, produce, and export wheat, but we have this, this different classes of wheat. Um, every, all, the, all the exporters as well as the importers are looking for something a little bit different, not only in what they can offer to the global market, but also what they're buying from the global market. And, and the United States now, because of, of our cutback in, in, um, in, in wheat production, but also because we had a harder time competing in the global markets on the wheat front, and we've fallen from really the number one wheat exporter several years ago to a number two or a number three, depending upon what year you want to pick. Uh, Russia is now the largest exporter of bulk wheat into the global markets. Again, you can see the blue bar, which is old crop, and then the, the red bar, which is the forecast for new crop. Uh, Russia, southern Russia in particular, has had some weather problems. Uh, it's getting a bit dry later on in the season. However, the, the crop is pretty much made. Um, the Russian uh, winter wheat crop, which is their predominant exports, has a production cycle very similar to Kansas. Um, and, and so when you think about when they're planting, when they're harvesting, uh, when the, the heads are filling, uh, that very, very similar time frame. So the dry weather that's sitting southern Russia now is really kind of late in the season. It might impact some of the test weights, but not necessarily impact the underlying yield. Now, the European Union is on a little bit different production cycle, a little bit later in the cycle, and they're two big countries that, that produce and export wheat, which is number one, France, and number two, Germany. Both have some dry areas showing up. Now, that's, they're getting closer kind of that reproductive stage where it's flowering, before it's pollinating, and we're starting to get seed development. So dry weather during that production phase may have a larger impact on, on, on potential yields and production later on. So that is something that the, the markets is watching very, very closely is the weather conditions in particular in both, again, France and Germany, and their ability then to potentially compete with this in the global market on exports. On, United, on the U.S., again, we, we're right now third largest and then followed closely by Canada when it looks at total bushels exported. Obviously, Canada, the primary export is spring wheat, some Durham. In the United States, we have winter wheat, which, which is the largest volume, and then spring wheat and Durham, as well as some white wheat and some soft red wheat. So we got a little bit more diversification in our classes. Um, we also think about Ukraine, Australia, and Argentina. Um, I do want to point out Australia very quickly. The last couple of years, Australia's had some severe drought conditions. It looks like some of those are now mitigating. Um, the Australian, the forecast for the Australian wheat production going into the 2021 marketing year is for a considerable rebound in their ability to export into the global market. And then my last slide, just to kind of wrap things up, is who buys 
you who buys wheat off the global market and and again because of the wide range and diversity of countries uh and that that actually buy wheat we we tend to lump them into categories um so we got north africa south asia and the middle east again those are bundles of countries um, if you look on the very bottom below the graph i've listed the countries that kind of that are included in those different categories um, for the u.s and the u.s market uh, we used to be a very dominant exporter into North Africa. Uh, the, the Russian exports uh, out of the Black Sea have really taken over because of logistical advantages and the, and, and the ability to basically uh, offer wheat, a very similar type of wheat at a lower price. So a lot of that North African biz business has shifted away from the United States and into the Black Sea region, in particular uh, Russia. So they've basically become the dominant exporter in that region. The same is the case for the Middle East. A, a lot of people don't think about the Middle East as being big wheat buyers, but uh, culturally and eth ethnically, um, wheat is part of their base. Um, and again, the United States has never been very dominant in the Middle East market, but we have had a presence. And again, a lot of that now has dissipated because of the, of the, the, the pricing pressure that Russia has been putting on um, in that region. Now, fortunately for us in the US, the South Asia market is still one of those dominant markets for us, in particular, the Philippines. Uh, Philippines is a big wheat buyer, especially a spring wheat buyer. So we do have a still a strong presence in South Asia, uh, South Asia markets. Again, we need to try and maintain those as we move forward. Um, our number two buyer of wheat from the United States for the United States is Japan. And number three, or excuse me, number two buyer is Mexico and number three buyer is Japan. So both the Mexican and Japanese markets are very, very important to U.S. wheat and U.S. wheat prices. Now, both Mexico and Japan when it comes to wheat have been very nice, stable markets. Um, we, that's, it's not necessarily being a big growth market, but it hasn't necessarily uh, been beat up as bad uh, by the competition from, um, in, in particular, that Black Sea region that, that we saw the loss of the North African market. Um, so with that, um, I'd be happy to try and answer some questions as we finish things up, but I'll now pass things on to Tim Petrie. Oh, excuse me, to Ron Hogan, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Frayne. Yeah, Ron Hogan, Extension Farm Management Specialist. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, a PPP Flexibility Act today. Uh, just a short presentation. So my, but my first slide, I want to, I want to uh, quickly talk about some C, CFAP stats just to keep you up, updated. Um, so far, the program's uh, rolled out 16.15 million to North Dakota. Non-specialty crops, in, in effect field crops, seven, a little over 7 million, 1,200 applications. One specialty application so far for a specialty crop. Livestock, almost 8 million, 1,100 applications. 11 applications for dairy. I have a couple notes as well. Um, there's been 30 million paid out uh, in North Dakota for the WIP Plus program, and uh, that's an ongoing program um, as well. Um, and we've been getting some questions uh, for on CPAP, uh, CFAP, yes, um, silage and hay are eligible for CFAP payments, and you need to convert the tons or pounds to bushels. So the next slide, uh, recently passed June 5th, the Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act. Now this is the fourth time they've changed the rules now um, and, and maybe it'll change them again. And as always, we get some of the basics and then there's more guidance coming in, in future days. Uh, so I'm gonna present what we know today and it might change tomorrow as, as usual it seems. So uh, as, of the, as of today then, there is still 145 billion left in the PPP front and, and you can still apply for PPP loans. So next, I wanted to talk about some of the aspects of the changes with this Flexibility Act. Um, the extension of the loan maturity. Loan repayment terms have been extended to five years. It previously was two years. Okay, so if you've gotten a two-year uh, PPP loan, you can discuss it with your lender and try maybe extend that for five years if you're so inclined. Um, there was no change in the interest rate. It's still at 1% for the old loans and the new loans. My next slide, I wanna talk about the extension of the loan period. Now, remember that was that eight-week 
eight week covered period that ended June 30th. Well, they've extended that now. Um, so the language says it's 24 weeks or December 31st, the end of the year then, whichever is earlier, okay? But if you have a PPP loan uh, prior to this passage of this act, prior to June 5th, you can elect to just retain your eight week forgiveness covered period uh, and, uh, and just continue on that way. Next, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more of forgiveness. Now, this is a big deal. Most people were very happy with these changes. I think there was a lot of pushback from people with PPP loans and, and Congress acted on this. Every, everyone is very happy with these changes. And one of, the, one of the things was the forgiveness change. Remember it was 75% of these proceeds must have been used for payroll. They reduced that now to 60%, okay, in order to receive forgiveness. Uh, if you use less than 60% for payroll, you're still eligible for a partial loan forgiveness. Next, the deferral period. Um, it was six months. Uh, uh, now it's to the date that the, the forgiveness is remitted to the lender. The federal government will eventually um, give money to the lender as, as forgiveness. And, and uh, so that's the, that's the end of the uh, deferral period for, for that now. They changed that. Next, there is a rehire worker deadline that's changed. It was June 30th and they changed that to the end of the year. You don't have to rehire your workers until the end of the year. Next, there is a delay in the employer payroll taxes. Uh, remember that you didn't have to pay half of your payroll taxes, you got a deferral, and but if you got your loan forgiven, then you were not eligible for that deferral. Well, they eliminated that rule completely. You are eligible for that deferral, whether you have forgiveness or not on your PPP loan. In my last slide, um, there's an exemption here, okay? And so it, it appears that they're trying to make most of these loans forgivable in many different ways, okay? So I'll just kind of read this to you. It's easier just to read it. From February 15th to the end of the year then, uh, forgiveness is to determine without regard to any proportional reduction in employees. Because there's a lot of businesses that aren't gonna be able to hire back their same employees or find the same quality or with the same skills that they had before. So uh, there's, two, there's two things that you need to document if you want an exemption. Uh, it's the, if you have the inability to rehire the, 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 the same employees uh, in the same number, uh, as you had on February, February 15th, um, and, uh, and you have the uh, an inability to rehire qualified employees to, to, for your on-fill positions till the end of the year. Or the second part is you have the inability to return to the same level of business activities. And I think that's, that's probably the case for a lot of businesses, especially restaurants, that they're probably not, only going to operate on half of their their uh, half of their customers now because of various various things. So if you if your business activity has changed uh, since February fifteenth due to compliance with regulations and 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 guidance uh, for COVID, uh, you uh, you should uh, you you are exempt uh, and and then you probably can get it forgiven. Okay, so that concludes what I have for you today. Uh, we're going to move on with Tim. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. If we go to my first slide, I'm going to just update some things that I've been talking with you in some cases several weeks and a new report came out and also kind of an update on cattle prices. Uh, the USDA Risk Management Agency just announced another change to a livestock risk protection program, and we discussed that last week, and so more on that in a minute. Uh, you'll recall for uh, cattle and hogs, the subsidy rate for many, many years was 13%. And then last year, on uh, July 1st of 19, they increased those rates as shown there in the blue to depending on your coverage level, 20 to 35%. Now, 
USDA just announced this week that as of July 1st and, and uh, a crop year for LRP is, is July 1st to uh, June 30th, they're increasing the rates for the 80 to 100% coverage another 5%. So going up 20, 5% on the higher coverage as listed there. And then another big change that I think affects both producers and lenders and makes it uh, much more palatable and maybe usable for uh, producers and from a lender standpoint as well, is for most crop insurance, crop insurance premiums are due at maturity, but on LRP, they have been do in advance. You have to pay for your premium and then the insurance agent submits the your LRP. And they are going to change that as of July 1st as well to now you do not have to pay in advance. And, and so again, a lot of our calves we sell in the fall, November, but here it is in June. And so we got to dig up money and it just made it a little bit more difficult for, I think, producers to use. And, and so that, that's a welcome change. So we go to my next slide. Uh, last week I talked to you about a, a marketing plan and actually to refresh your memory and those of you that might be new on the call, two weeks ago, uh, Frayne did a very good job of explaining marketing plans to you and, and, uh, and then last week I took that on and, and came up with a, what I, a fairly simple calf marketing plan that I explained to you. And so I'm not going to re-explain that. If you want to see Frange, you go just go to the historic two weeks ago and then my explanation of this last week if you want more. But again, one of the things that one of the characteristics that Frange said of a good marketing plan is that you have to modify it when needed. And so that is kind of the case here. Um, you know, recall that I said we were just going to use livestock risk protection as a way to pre-price 50% of our calves that we have to sell on uh, just picked October 29th and actually going to do a fourth and a fourth. And again, go back to my last weeks to explain that. But I, you know, a good marketing plan has both a price objective and a time deadline. And so I said, if steers get to 155 on LRP. Let's do it whenever they do. If they don't get there, our time deadline is June 30th. So again, we're modifying this plan now. I just said instead of a time deadline of June 30th for that first fourth that we're going to price, let's change that to July 1st for those reasons I just talked about. One, you're going to get in one day, you're going to get another 5% reduction in your premium. And instead of paying in advance, you won't have to uh, get the money until you sell the cattle at the end and so maybe make it easier on a cash flow basis. So go to the next slide. You know, a lot of a lot of consternation in the cattle industry and so on and that prices seem low and so on. And uh, of course, you know, we've got an unprecedented pandemic. We've got an unprecedented decline in the domestic economy as Brian talked about. We have unprecedented social unrest. Any one of those would cause volatility and could cause a lower cattle prices. But in spite of that, it's kind of interesting that cattle prices in North Dakota are not much different than they were a year ago. Now you can argue a year ago wasn't the best year ever be, it wasn't the best year because it was lower than the last several years. But still, you know, I started off when, with these webinars saying our expectation was for prices to go down 20% after the pandemic hit. And they, for the most part, did that. But we've seen recovery. And again, there's a seasonal issue that goes on with each of the markets classes. But interestingly enough, we're about the same on all our important market classes of cattle than we were last year, starting in the upper left-hand corner with 550 to 600 pound calves. And again, we don't have a lot of them to sell right now, except some fall born calves. But, you know, last week they averaged 164, a year ago 161. And so we're $3 better right now, $3 better than we were last year, in spite of everything being unprecedented with the pandemic and social unrest and domestic economy. Switch over to the upper right hand side for the heavier weight 750 to 800 pounders. 
Uh, they were 138 last week, but 141 a year ago. So they're down three from a year ago. And, you know, which uh, again is, you know, is uh, something somewhat of a feat, I suppose, that they would be about the same down three and calves were up three, go down to the bottom left. Then our slaughter steers, our five area uh, price there. Uh, last week averaged 112.39 last year. 113.76, so down just a dollar 37 over what they were a year ago. Now, I, however, I realize, you know, we've got slaughter backed up, and uh, for you producers trying to sell fed cattle, if your packing plant is struggling with COVID and so on, and you're not getting uh, uh, bids, uh, a price similar to last year doesn't mean much because you're having to hold the cattle and try to find a place to sell them. So we're all well aware of that, but from a strict price standpoint, right, uh, just a dollar off from where they were last year at this time and then go over to the cow cow prices kind of a similar story there had a you know a big decline in prices as the others down 20 percent but back up uh, and we don't have cow prices reported by USDA in North Dakota so I just take the average of the Montana South Dakota where they're reported but last week averaged and again a wide range in cow prices these are lean but you've got cutters and canners and 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 premium whites and so there's a wide wide range and just like in calf prices are in cow prices but last week for this series 57 compared to 61 last year so down about four dollars and so again very similar prices go on to the next slide one of the reasons why prices probably are as as good as they have been or or at least similar to last year, not necessarily good in some of our eyes, I guess. Is it our, uh, you know, we were wondering the, this week, the ERS, Economic Research Service, put out the new livestock and meat trade data for April. Again, we're about a month and a half behind or so there because of the time it takes to tabulate. Uh, originally this year, again, we were expecting record beef, pork and uh, exports for sure. And, uh, but we were expecting them to fall off in April <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. One, because of higher prices for meat. And then secondly, because of the, all the problems with, with uh, COVID, not only in the US, but in other countries and, and so on. And so starting in the upper left, um, beef exports did fall off uh, somewhat in April, just a little bit below, only 2% below last year, but still quite a bit above the average and still on an annual basis, uh, we'd be close to a record. But, you know, I think we're, we're struggling now in May too. And so we probably won't set a record. And USDA is saying that now for 2020, but still be pretty good compared to a history standpoint. And so there's good news that uh, meat is still moving more on a country by country basis in a minute, but let's uh, go over to pork. Pork, again, we started off there in October of last year, just going gangbusters on exports. And we kept that off a little, kept that going a little bit off in April, not much, but, uh, but still compared to last year and the average uh, uh, record uh, pork exports down on the broiler side on the lower left hand corner again we have a seasonal pattern there they're usually up in March and off in April so that was the case this year had a really really good market in March it did fall off in April still above last year uh, given all uh, all the problems we're having and uh, and uh, and above the average and then over onto the milk side we did uh, better on our milk and cream exports, again, we don't export a lot and it's to our nearby Canada and Mexico. The, the main reason why milk went up is because prices went down, unlike the others where in the meat side, prices went up, that helped to back off prices a little bit or, or exports a little bit because prices were higher on the milk side, milk prices plummeted. So it made it a little bit better uh, deal for our customers. So go to the next slide. I'm gonna follow up then on uh, similar to what Frayne was talking about and uh, look at kind of some country, country basis there. Start off with beef. Again, Japan is usually our best customer, then Korea, then Mexico and Canada. And uh, last year, Korea and Mexico were very, very close, but because we didn't have a trade agreement 
with Japan and we had pulled out of TPP, but now as of January 1st, we're back with a trade agreement similar to our competitors. So exports uh, really, really nice. And actually we're up in April to Japan, second highest ever exports just compared to mid uh, 2018. So a really, really good market on Japan for us and then uh, Mexico the blue line down there you see they dropped off to fourth place and uh, and Frain mentioned some of the problems with Mexico a couple things here on the on the beef exports to Mexico one of course is our prices went up and Mexico likes to buy cheaper things and then the peso has declined and so that further makes our meat more expensive to them and so that's kind of the reason why our Mexican dropped off but again our exports did quite well particularly to Japan go down to the pork side Again, on the, our best customers historically have been Mexico, Japan, and then Canada and Korea tied for third place, and then China fifth, but now uh, China has bought wet skyrocketed up into first place and set an all-time record high in April of, of uh, pork exports to uh, China because of their deficit. So go to the next slide kind of to wrap things up. One of the questions we're getting, and you know, you see the top line there is live hog prices in China. The bottom line is blue, uh, 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 is US hog prices. Again, they're both on a US dollar per pound basis. So one of the reasons for all our exports to China has simply been that, you know, their production is down 25 to 40%. They have sky high prices, but everybody's asking since we're exporting record high amounts to China, why hasn't that helped our price here? And which is a very good question. And there are two reasons for this and Frain kind of alluded to the phase one with China and so on. We do have a phase one agreement with China, but one of the problems was that the, it did, phase one did not retur, uh, remove the retaliatory tariffs. So we've got a 60% tariff on carcass pork and a 70% tariff on pork cuts and we're yeah we're sending a record amount there but when it gets to China it's expensive because of that tariff and then the other thing is here we have the backlog in the pork industry and slaughter backed up and packing plants can't handle it all although we're back to well, this week it looks like we're going to be back to about 94 percent of where we were last year but this time seasonally pork uh, slaughter does usually drop off and so uh, but we're back to similar to what we were last year but that's the reason we haven't been helped is be mainly because of the tariffs 60 70 percent tariff if those tariffs were removed tomorrow our prices would 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 go up quite a bit here in the U.S. so with that let's uh, go to Dave and talk energy. Great thanks Tim uh, Dave Ripplinger bioproducts bioenergy economics specialist I'm going to talk today about the director's cut uh, for those of you who might not be familiar. So uh, Lynn Helms, who's the director of the Department of Mineral Resources uh, in North Dakota, has an, uh, a monthly webinar. Uh, happens to be this afternoon uh, at two o'clock. So just after this one, uh, typically has some really important stuff. And I just wanted to kind of, first of all, bring it to your attention and then also kind of give you some background information or kind of frame it in case you might watch or hear the things that come out of it. Uh, a month ago, it, it kind of created some additional news as, as Director Helms spoke about uh, shutting in wells and the like and what the, that was meaning for production. And so again, we're kind of looking to see if there's any hints of what might be uh, happening in the industry. A couple of thoughts on why this is important. Of course, you know, North Dakota is an energy state, um, but, you know, even more broadly than that, you know, energy is important because it's both an indicator of, of you know, what's going on, because a lot of our economy requires significant amounts of energy, particularly crude oil and petroleum products to, to operate. And then also there's a whole lot of uh, economic activity associated with uh, oil development and production. And so it's, it's a great number. And of course, right now, uh, production in the country uh, is down significantly. You know, I've reported on that the last couple of weeks. Uh, the other thing to bring up too, you know, in terms of its role, uh, more on the state level, you know, in terms of jobs, uh, you know, North Dakota jobs, uh, wealth creation for whoever might have royalties or be involved in those businesses. And then last tax revenue generation, which primarily flows through the state, but a lot of that does come back to, to local government. Uh, just some quick stats from North Dakota Job Service uh, about what was, what's been going on 
in the, the, the mining uh, and development industry specifically. Uh, so if we go back to the first three weeks of April, which is when that uh, industry was really hit hard, there was more than a thousand jobless claims each week. Uh, right now, that sector has the highest number of claims out of all of them was 6,400, uh, which is about, about a fourth of what's out there. And similarly, in terms of actual unemployment payments via the, from the state, so just traditional state unemployment, that three and a half million dollars for the last week is also about 25% of, of what we're paying out. Uh, just to talk about some of the definitions, which is things you might just want to know being in North Dakota or you know, having some relationship with energy, is to understand what completion is or what a completed well is. Uh, you know, a, a, there, there's, a, there's a big difference between a, a, a well that's been drilled and a well that's been completed because those, those completion activities, casing, cementing, fracking and the like, everything it takes to actually get to producing oil uh, is significant, both in terms of the effort and possibly the, the economic activity associated with that. And then finally, actually generating oil uh, you know, for production and use, as well as all, all of the, the royalties and the like generated from that. Uh, differentiating really important uh, between a shut-in or an inactive well and an abandoned well. Uh, this really came to a head two months ago, and there's a lot of news about that when the Industrial Commission allowed for wells to be inactive for more than a year. And so kind of leading from that, so this inactive well is one that, that's not currently producing, uh, but could, uh, could be uh, with some, some quick work, as opposed to an abandoned well, which is permanently plugged, everything is taken away from the surface, and there might be some re remediation if necessary. Uh, two really big differences, and then again, in the last two months, we've seen a number of wells, at least a third of them, uh, shut in. And the question is, how many more have there been? And that's one of the things you might hear from uh, Director Helms this afternoon. Uh, the other big thing to, to, to touch on, and I, I know I've mentioned it before, uh, is the concept of the depletion rate, which is essentially that, that rate at which production declines. And it's really different for, for shale oil, tight oil, than it is for conventional uh, oil. And here's just a a, a chart that I grabbed from a, a academic publication that shows what it looks like in the Bakken, for example, versus a conventional uh, uh, oil well. And really what you see in general, the state states that you lose about half of your, your production, your daily production falls by about half uh, in the first year. Others, industry in this, show that it's really closer to about uh, at least two thirds, if not three fourths. And so this is really important for a number of reasons. One, you know, in order to maintain production uh, in, 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 for shale plays, in, for shale formations like the Bakken, you need to have continual investment, you know, con continual activity in terms of, of, of developing these wells because uh, production does fall off so quickly. Uh, another term that's used a lot is legacy well. So that's any well that's been around for more than a month, you know, from the uh, previous period. And the other thing to talk about too is associated gas. And so it's really important to, if you think nationally about differences in some of the big fossil fuel plays. So the Bakken is an oil play. Oil is the driver. Folks are, are drilling for oil and there's gas that's also produced at the same time. You know, since it's a co-product, not the main product, it's associated gas. If you go to other parts of the country where there's natural gas plays, so uh, if, for example, uh, the Marcellus and some of those other uh, formations in Appalachia, you know, natural gas is the product. And so here we're going to call it associated gas for the Bakken and other places. It's just, uh, you know, just regular uh, natural gas. Again, just kind of bring this to your attention and, you know, definitely if you have some time this afternoon or later on, because they are recorded, just to listen in on, on, on Director Helms. It's a little bit technical, which is why I covered some of these these things in case you do listen. Um, but again, really just trying to hear, you know, what the actual final numbers were for the end of April. Uh, again, that was the first full month of, of COVID impacting the industry, especially here in the state. If we look back to that tail end of April when we had negative prices, uh, and of course, those first three weeks when un unemployment uh, or first time employment or those initial claims were very, very high. So really just want to hear, you know, you know, how many wells are actually producing and we can use that to calculate shut-ins and what production has been. And of course, the, the reports about a month ago is that they'd already fallen by about a third, uh, both in terms of well producing and production. The numbers are likely significantly higher than that, at least half or more. And that's the number 
I would definitely be listening for. The other thing too, is just to know that there's comments beyond the data, just beyond the, the, the figures being reported. And those types of things can be really, really important to, to, to understand uh, other, other information, uh, maybe a more current uh, picture of what's going on versus numbers that are about six weeks old. So that's what I had to present. Uh, and so now we'll turn it over to Q&A. Uh, again, uh, we'd ask you to use the Q&A tool to ask questions uh, and, and, and we'll uh, continue on from there. I'm gonna stop sharing and bring everybody else back up. Uh, and so if anybody has any questions, uh, now is the time. Uh, since there aren't any up already, I just ask uh, the panelists if there's any thoughts that came to mind after their presentation or things that they thought of while others were speaking. Hey, Freen, this is Ron. Why, why, why was Australia on their wheat production so projected to increase so much from the previous? Okay, so th again, the graphic that I showed was export volume. So that wasn't production, but what's the forecast for actual exportable stocks? And, and they had, uh, Australia had, well, really three consecutive years of, of drought. And, and each year, each consecutive year, the drought, of course, built upon itself and got worse and worse and worse. And so total wheat production was down three consecutive years, years in Australia, and therefore exportable stocks was down pretty significantly. And the current um, expectation, the current, current viewpoint is that both production as well as exports will actually rebound again back to levels that we've seen historically. Again, Australia is starting to get some more rainfall. Uh, you may have heard about uh, some flooding that was actually going on because they had pretty heavy rains following the drought. So soil moistures are now being recharged. Again, planted acreage looks like it might be increasing slightly, uh, but the biggest part is, is the rebound in the yields because they're getting rains again. Okay, and we do have a, a question. Uh, and I might need a little bit of clarification, but the question is going back to a WASD graphic. Uh, Frank, could you talk about the shift from beans to corn? Okay. Um, so when USDA, in particular, when they look at the, uh, that, that graphic right there. So when, they, when, when USDA prepares the estimates for ending stocks, okay, again, this would be the amount of grain we have in the bin just before harvest. The, the, in the 2020 and 2021 forecast for the new crop forecast, they use the March planting intentions report as the basis, the starting point for how many acres of corn are gonna be planted. And from that, of course, they subtract out corn silage and they do the rest of the math. Well, the surprise, a bit of a shock value in the, in the March planting intentions report was the, the larger than expected increase in corn acres and a larger, uh, not as large an increase in the soybean acreage. So the surprise number was the corn. And again, given the time period of the survey, so this is a survey of farmers at the beginning of March saying, what are you intending to plant? What are your plans as of today, knowing that they can change later on? Well, the real financial impact, the price impact of COVID-19 didn't hit until after that survey was taken. And so because of the drop in ethanol uh, consumption and ethanol production, as well as a whole bunch of other things revolved around COVID-19, the price relationships between corn and soybeans shifted pretty dramatically. And so right now the current thinking in the marketplace is that we didn't get all of the 97 million acres that were originally forecasted planted this year, that there was some of that shifted back into the soybean outside of the ledger, not on the corn side. Now, one of the things I forgot to mention or failed to mention in my discussion was on June 30th, on June 30, USDA will release the acreage report. So the acreage report is an update to that March planting intentions report. So again, they surveyed farmers in March saying, what do you intend to plant? And then they surveyed them about this time of the month now at the it, kind of in the middle of the month and saying, how many acres did you actually plant? And then that will be all compiled and reported at the end of June. So June 30, we're gonna get the acreage report, which will be an update to say how many acres were actually planted. And I am looking for some excitement, I guess, uh, around those numbers. Uh, we will get some information about what the the uh, the trade is expecting. Again, these private forecasters that are that are also trading in the marketplace on what they think the numbers will look like, and so uh, that I think will be in our next major USDA report that causes some some excitement in the marketplace. So look for June 30 as as that date. 
There is another question from Wonderful. Keith about for Ron. Will 11 page forgiveness PPP application get modified, Ron? <clears throat> Boy, uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I haven't heard anything that it would or wouldn't. So I, I, I couldn't answer that. Great, thanks, Ron. Uh, you guys see any other questions up on the board? Uh, if not, I no. wanna thank everyone maybe, first. Maybe, maybe. Uh, this is Tim. I think we're scheduled now for two more weeks on Friday, but not on July 3rd. So maybe if we could get some feedback whether uh, participants would would be wanting us to go into July or, mm -hmm. or uh, have we served our purpose? That would be helpful to us because we have to plan ahead and make reservations and so on. So maybe some feedback there would be helpful for us. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Great point. And if you want to, you could give that to us via the survey, you know, because that will open up as you close the window. Uh, otherwise, you could just let us know by email or, or give us a call. Um, one comment. One comment I wanted to make at the end, <clears throat> just for our participants, is I, as I was thinking about this. I think that, and this is me going out on a limb a little bit, which we economists really hate doing because, you know, we're wrong a lot. But anyway, I really think that we're only going to wind up having a recession for the first quarter and second quarter. Um, so to have a recession, you have to have two consecutive negative growth quarters. And I think that the second quarter is going to be so deep that we really have nowhere to go but up kind of a thing. So it's going to look like maybe the recession was short lived a two month ordeal because we already know that the first quarter was negative and we, it, the second quarter has almost got to be negative. Uh, but since it was so fast and so deep, it's not going to be, in, in, in other words, if we go down to where hypothetically everyone's unemployed and then you start adding jobs, uh, even, even at a trickle in the quarters that follow, you will have growth and therefore you are out of the recession. But that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story because this would this could be so deep by the time they tabulate the cost on everything that really we have nowhere to go but up from there is kind of a thing. So just when as you're hearing the news and, and things like that and you hear oh well the recession's over because we had a couple of quarters of positive growth. Remember, we might be starting from a really low period. And so even though, yes, there's some growth and yes, the recession is technically over, we haven't recovered anywhere near what we've lost. So uh, I just want folks going forward to keep that in mind that it really depends on where you're starting from, right? Yep. So that, that, that was all I had there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, and I actually heard yesterday from, a, from an economist is that the recession may be over, like as of today, you know, we're, we may have already passed that technically speaking. I, and, and, and I agree. I mean, we, we, uh, we added, we add, we're adding jobs. The number of people newly uh, going on the unemployment rolls is less than the new jobs that are, the jobs that are returning. That's what we're seeing. That's why we've got the stabilization of weekly jobless claims or even decline in it. Mm -hmm. But remember, when you have 30 million, 20 some million unemployed, and yes, the gains are higher than the losses, uh, it's still not a good place to be, even though the recession, it, because it's all definition, it's all in the definition. And that's one thing that are my pro, the participants need to understand. And there's so many arguments about unemployment and how many are truly unemployed, because you may have a perception in your mind on what that means, but the definition and how the data is reported is different. Okay, so again, when they say recession over, that doesn't mean we, re, we regained everything that we lost, that just means we stopped digging and have actually started to crawl out. And it could be a slow crawl, or it could be a quick rebound, that's the V-shape recovery. Um, that remains to be seen on which one it'll turn out. And we could actually have a double dip, I mean. But considering how drastic the jobs cuts were in the spring, it's hard to imagine um, it being as bad or worse again. Uh, uh, that's, that's all I'm saying, I mean, that cut was deep, so. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, again, want to thank all the panelists and everyone who uh, chimed in this afternoon. Uh, hope to, to see you again next week, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks.